I've got written down here for today's episode that I'm being joined by the Insight Boys. Is that, is that how you normally go, by? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jonathan Calvert. I'm the Insight Editor of the Sunday Times. And I'm George Arbuthnot, and I'm the Deputy Insight Editor. Insight being the Sunday Times' legendary investigations unit. Right, Jonathan, you've been looking into student recruitment and university applications in the UK. The UCAS deadline for applications is this week, 31st of January, so it's on people's minds. What first got you sniffing around this area? We were looking at the kind of explosion of the numbers of overseas students into the UK in recent years. And the numbers have increased from something like 460,000 to 680,000 between 2018 and 2022. In 2022, there was the biggest ever rejection rate of British applicants from the Russell Group universities. And so there was a real sense that universities might be favouring foreign students. Foreign students pay much higher tuition fees Mm. than UK students. Almost four times higher. UK fees are frozen at £9,250 a year. For overseas students, some universities charge as much as £38,000. Universities are desperate for overseas students. They send people over to Asia and Africa, recruiting at fairs because they're so short of cash. They hire agents and pay agents a huge amount of money to go and recruit those students for them. It's become kind of big business for the universities. So Jonathan and George started investigating how these students actually get on these courses at Russell Group universities, the top research universities, and whether the process is fair. What we discovered were special pathways that were only open to foreign students. Mm that would allow you to get still get into these, these top-notch degrees despite your lowly academic achievements. International pay more money. Yeah. And the school will receive almost double. Yeah. So they give a lean way for international students. Up to 30,000 overseas students a year use these special pathways. Some can get on competitive courses with just a handful of C grades at GCSE, where the British students would have needed A star, AA, at A level. Is this the way our universities should be run? Or is it too unlevel a playing field? Because of this story, the Department for Education say they're urgently investigating. You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Luke Jones. Today, Cash for Access, the undercover insight investigation at top universities. So you guys obviously wanted to look into this a little bit more, for which you had to go undercover, and I've never done this myself. How do you set about doing that? I mean, is there quite a sort of high bar for you to start doing something like that on a story? Uh, yeah, absolutely. We um, we have to set out very clearly why we think this is important, why mm. it's in, in the public interest. We have to kind of explain why we couldn't get the information by any other means. And then we kind of have to list our evidence and we have meetings with the editors and our lawyer to see if we feel that the undercover is justified. And in this case, we thought it clearly was. It was obviously in the public interest because there was an inequality at the heart of this. And UK students, on the one hand, were more and more applying. An increasing number are not getting into university. On the other hand, uh, the Mm. universities are keen to attract more and more foreign students. And so as a result of all that, a certain number of British students will lose out. And it wasn't a particularly difficult guise that we, we adopted. Yes, We simply said that we were both parents with children who wanted to go to a top university. They'd been studying at a UK boarding school, but they were foreign nationals. 
they're not the kind of strongest students. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, they haven't been in the top sets, for example. And um, so I wasn't sure that they'd be able to um, get into great universities like Exeter. Um, but they weren't particularly academically gifted and so therefore didn't have anything like mm. the grades that they would need to get into one of those universities. And one of the first universities that you tipped up at in this guise was Exeter University. Mm -hmm. Who do you meet? What do they tell you? So yeah, we arrived at Exeter and we met with Chloe Sully, who was the marketing executive for a company called Into. Hmm. Now, Into is a company that has partnered with Exeter University to run its special pathway courses for foreign students. Exeter's kind of outsourced it to a private company. So as in running the courses or finding the people to come on the courses? Both. I see. So this Both. is a, a private company doing this on behalf of the exactly. university. Yeah. And so we arrived at the campus and you, you walk into the kind of central quad of the campus and there's the library and the theatre. But then there's a building called Into University of Exeter, which is a play on the name of Into the company. Mm, yeah. Chloe Sully's wearing a University of Exeter lanyard around her neck. When we were communicating with her beforehand, she had an official University of Exeter email address. Mm. And when we contacted it initially, Exeter admissions department, they referred us on to, on to Chloe Sully. And so they, they're kind of completely kind of hand in glove mm. with the university. Her partner with the university will work really closely with the international team. Yeah. So, for example, if a student doesn't quite meet the IELTS requirement or total requirements, etc., they'll refer them on to us. She first gave us a tour of the business school, which is about a stone's throw from this into building. Um, and we ended up having a chat with Chloe in the building's canteen, along with another of her colleagues called Mia Tan, who was the international student recruitment manager for INTO. For direct entry, uh, I think the standard entry requirement for a business um, program will be AAB. For your son that's studying A-levels, yeah. to get onto the program, the foundation of international, it would be C, yes, two C's and a D. Right, yeah. But I think there's flexibility on those entry requirements as, as well. He, so he got, uh, David got CCD. Oh, OK, brilliant. Um, so that's... Yeah, so he would <laughs> yeah. be... Um, able to get onto our programs. It's basically tick everything we need for um, academic entry requirements. Great. So CCD for A-levels and C in mathematics is perfect for uh, international year one. And the international year one effectively is kind of like a shadow first year course. So instead of going into the university in your first year, you get taught at the INTO Centre which is the heart of campus at Exeter University. And then, just as every student does when you pass your exams at the end of the first year, you then go into the actual undergraduate degree second year. They were asking what A-levels our sons had, and, and, and the particular example we gave was that they had two Cs and a D. And um, both Chloe and Mia we're absolutely sure that that wasn't a problem at all because that fulfilled their entry requirement. On the other hand, we asked them what it would have required to get into the same course, which we were applying for the business course, and that would have been two A's and a B at Exeter. So quite the discount if, yeah. you, if you're the overseas student going through this way. Yeah, an enormous discount. If you imagine two C's and a D as opposed to two A's and a B is a big difference. Mm. The only difference is that the international students do this year with into and they and they get a lot of extra english hmm. tuition as you as you can imagine because english might not be their first language they also get kind of more one-to-one -one tuition than perhaps a first year university student does but other than that there's not an enormous amount of difference and if you had been a uk student applying to the business school with two c's and a d you'd you'd have never got in hmm. once they complete this this pathway year. Mm. They then have to pass exams before they move into the degree course. Mm. But just like a normal first year student would have to pass their first year exams. Yeah. But we asked the into staff members how difficult it was to pass these exams. And 
they said that for some countries it was 100% pass rates and overall it was a 93% pass rate, despite the fact that the students had come in with such lowly academic achievements. And so they were very reassuring that our less intelligent sons mm. would, would have no yes. problem of getting onto the degree. One of the other things that we uh, discovered at, when we were discussing all of this with Mia and Chloe uh, was that, that we had another son who was only 16 years old and was studying his GCSEs. We understood that that son might be eligible for something called the International Foundation Course, which was also run by Into at the centre in, in their campus at, at Exeter. And the International Foundation is a course that's like a bridging course for foreign students. Hmm. You, you do study for a year, and at the end of the year, you'll have been given a conditional offer, and as long as you pass that at the end of the year, you go into the first year of a degree course. But the requirements for this are incredibly low. So our 16-year-old son would have been able to enter the foundation year at, uh, run by Into at Exeter University with just five Bs at GCSE, as well as that they had to have at least a C in maths, which is incredibly low grade. And that would mean that as a 16-year-old, mm. he could have left his school with his five Bs at GCSE, and he could then have taken up a place on the International Foundation course at Exeter University. Mm. Which would be um, a year. Which would be a year. Yeah. And then by the time he's 17, mm. this child would already be in university. And after just one year, he'd be an undergraduate on the first year of a university course. Yeah. Okay, so just to be clear with that then, so for the end prize of a business degree from Exeter University, mm -hmm. you can either apply as a home student, mm -hmm. if that's who you are, and they require from you, what was it, three A's or A star? Two A's and a B. Two A's and a B. Or you can be an overseas student and go into the into mm -hmm. foundation year mm -hmm. where you would need two C's and a D, was it, at A-level? That's if you want to do the international year one. If you do the international year one, yeah. and then the high likelihood you then slip on the rest of the degree mm -hmm. course. Or even earlier than that, you cannot have any A-levels. You can have five Bs at GCSE, mm -hmm. do the foundation international foundation year, high likelihood move on to the rest of the degree course, end up with your degree. And, and, yeah. and, and you're starting wow. the degree course in that circumstance, age 17, a year before your English mates from school have left school. Mm. And so you'll effectively be alongside the kids from the year above you mm. who've got three A's at A-level, mm. and you're, the, you're there the year below them with just five B's at GCSE. What did Exeter University say to you once you said you weren't undercover and you didn't have these kids? They said that all of its applicants, whether from the UK or abroad, are considered on merit and equally when they apply to study. All offers are competitively set to attract the very best students from across the world. What about Into? Did they say anything? Into said in their statement, our programmes are intensive and high quality and meet all UK requirements. Jonathan and George, you've been telling us about this system by which it seems overseas students who aren't at the required academic level that home students might need to be at to get into a course, can get into courses. But you also spoke to one of these sort of recruitment agencies based in London. Who are they and whereabouts were they? So yeah, so there's this kind of industry of student recruitment agencies growing up and um, their job is to scour the schools around the world for fresh supplies of overseas students who can be lured to Britain. Mm. And and now about half of all the foreign students studying at UK universities have been sourced through agents. And the universities pay them a lot of money. So we went to visit one of the leading recruitment agents called Amber Education. Still pretending to be dads. Still pretending to be dads. Yes. Um, everyone has a problem opening that door. Yeah. <laughs> did you come buzz it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did buzz it, but it's one of those, it's so quiet, it doesn't have a buzzing sound. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. it's kind of, it's a great place to be there, isn't it, right on Regent Street? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, Amber Education has offices on Regent Street in London, and 
we met with their education officer called Sam Lamb, who's a real veteran of the industry. The agency sends about 2,000 mainly Chinese students a year to British universities, including several hundred via the special pathways mm. each year. And they're the official agent for Nottingham, York, Exeter, and Durham universities. So, Jonathan, what did Sam Lamb advise you? Well, Sam Lamb was very, very keen on promoting the international pathways as a route to get our students into one of the best universities. He was very kind of, he was very encouraging, and he, he was in no doubt why overseas students were offered much lower grades. He, he said that international students pay more money. And the university will receive almost double, so they give leeway to international students. Again, international pay more money. Yeah. And the school will receive almost double. Yeah. So they give a lean way for international students. Yeah, yeah. a lot. Yeah. I mean, like, it's a lot of difference between GSCSEs yeah, and it's, A levels. It's, it's a lot of money you, you pay for. <laughs> <as well. laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's why. Um, you don't have to go through that way. So not beating around the bush? No, he's not. He was absolutely clear. This was all about money and that you could, as a foreign national, well, in effect, buy a place on much lower grades in a top university, and it was all possible. And this isn't open to home students. I mean, I couldn't say, you know, I've got this child... I've heard about international students doing this. If I've got the money, can I sort of put them through that as well? No, none of these pathways. Mm. The International Foundation and the International Year One are not open to UK students. The universities do say that they run foundation courses for children who are a bit disadvantaged. Mm. Um, Maybe they've come from a poor educational background or their their parents aren't very wealthy or whatever. Mm. Or maybe they're a kind of a particular economic group that needs help. But they're totally different. And there's no comparison because, in effect, they are kind of chosen because of those circumstances, whereas the overseas students are from a kind of wealthy elite. I mean, if you imagine, it's not just the £38,000 in tuition fees. It's also you've got all your living costs on top. So sending a child from overseas to a UK university probably costs in the region about 50 to 60 grand a year. So you have to be very wealthy. So you're talking about a very kind of select group of people. The English kids can qualify for the foundation if they're very disadvantaged, whereas the foreign kids can only get onto it if they're extremely wealthy. One of the other crucial things that he revealed to us was we asked him, you know, it's not it's not well known, these special pathways. In fact, you know, this is the first time that they'll have been written about. And we were astonished to, to discover their, their existence. And so we said to him, why were they so little publicized in the, in the UK? And he said, they won't advertise them with UK local students. They wouldn't put up posters. The UK students wouldn't accept it. I advertise it to my Hong Kong student. Yeah. They wouldn't advertise with UK local students. Because so it's they just wouldn't not... put posters. They wouldn't, they wouldn't accept no, it. They wouldn't so. pay the, the, the difference in fee. Mm-hmm. And they will not be qualified because they're home students. They're past different queue. I just wonder whether the universities were slightly embarrassed that that no, they no, they, no. they they this have is, one standard for one and well one standard. Well stand. Yeah, it yeah. is. It's not something they want to, to tell you, but mm-hmm. it's the truth. It's not something they want to tell you, but it's the truth. In a statement, representatives for Amber Education said Lam had given inaccurate figures for the number of students the company was assisting but they didn't provide alternative figures. They added that the company gives advice to students on, quote, their potential prospects of being accepted to universities through the official pathways, taking into account the applicable requirements of the universities and the students' situation and background. They said students are required to meet the entrance requirements set by universities. If he said then that part of the motivation for universities on this front is they'll get more money from these overseas students, so that's why they're keen for it. How desperate for the money are they, Jonathan, do we know? 
Well, the universities at the moment are in a bit of a financial crisis. They're heavily dependent on tuition fees, which account for half of their total funding. Meanwhile, their costs have soared due to energy bills, mm. inflation fuel cost increases, kind of increases in wages and pensions. And given that the UK tuition fees are capped at £9,250, the only way they have any leeway is is foreign students because they can bring in more of them. They can charge them whatever they like. And so this is kind of the one area of growth in their money. Hmm. Now, some of these universities might say, well, the proof is in the pudding. OK, it might be that it's a bit easier for some of these students to get in on, on lower grades, lower entry requirements, but they still have to do the same course. They're still going to be assessed and examined in the same way, and they'll end up with you know, a degree, so they'll have earned it. I mean, when you look at those, the the success rate on the way out, is it the same as, as the home students who went in? So we've been analysing the degree results, and what it shows is that students from outside the EU have been performing significantly worse than the UK students. So they have actually been more than twice as likely to receive a lower second or third class degree compared to UK students, so a, a, a poor degree result, effectively. Mm. Have you heard from any of the people who teach these courses about what they think about this system, of having you know, maybe kids who aren't quite up to some of these degree courses going through them? We've spoken to Professor Geoffrey Alderman, um, who's a visiting fellow of the Oxford Centre for Higher Education Policy Studies, and he said that he was aware that... that lecturers have had to pitch teaching at a lower level because the foreign students were not able to cope mm. with the normal teaching provided. And he says that this was impacting the British students because they were having to go at a, a much slower rate and also having to teach in a more kind of rote learning style. Mm. And this meant that the British students were being held back and were kind of having to go and teach themselves at the library in order to progress at the rate that, that they should yeah. be doing. And we also spoke to another lecturer from a, a London university who said that the low levels of English of these overseas students was also affecting teaching. And they were really struggling to keep up on, on the courses, which again meant they had to go at a slower pace for the rest of the students in the class. Jonathan, is this the kind of thing you think you were expecting when you started on this? I mean, it's quite shocking stuff, some of it. I mean, are you surprised? We are surprised, actually. When we um, when we embarked on it, we thought that if they dropped grades, maybe they dropped like one grade, you know, maybe it's two A's and a B, and down to an A and two B's or something like that. But the levels of the drop are extraordinary. I mean, you know, they're several grades down. And then when you factor in, you know, the kind of the international foundation courses where, you, where within a year you can be transported from doing your GCSEs into the first year of a highly competitive university degree. We actually, when, when we first saw that you could do this with GCSEs, kind of just kept kind of rubbing our eyes and saying, that can't be right. There has to be a reason for this. But no, it was what was said, wasn't it? I mean, all the, all the people we talked to said that yeah. that is possible, yeah. Well, we assumed that you needed these GCSEs and those A-levels. Yeah. But... <laughs> and you're missing a page of the exactly. document somewhere. But, no. but, but when we checked with the recruitment agent and then the universities themselves, it became clear that that was not the case. We were, we were genuinely astonished. I mean, I remember saying this to Jonathan, saying, I think... I actually think that you might be able to get in there with just a GCSE. Jonathan wouldn't believe me. <laughs> so yes, I remember, yeah. And, and what does this say then about the state of British universities, Jonathan, and then and the way things are now? Well, it's surprising, isn't it, that a great academic institutions, and they are fabulous, willing to kind of compromise their standards by having different grade differentials in this way. There is a bigger debate that has to be had, and I think quite often a lot of people are trying to have that debate, but it never seems to go anywhere, which is, do we properly fund our higher education institutions? I mean, we've had an explosion in the number of people who who go to university and want to go to university, and are we putting the, enough money in to hmm. fund them? And ultimately... Uh, you could accuse the universities of profiteering, but equally you could just say that they've been put in this mm. kind of bit of a bind where they can't make ends meet and therefore mm. have to do this. And if they're then doing this to try and ease their financial situation, 
What do you say to the person listening to this who says, so what? They're making it work. British students are still getting in. Overseas students are getting in. The system carries on. Well, the, the problem is, is that, as we saw with the, the figures for the Russell Group universities, you could see that while well, the number of foreign students was going up, the number of places for UK students was going down. And so you're having a less opportunity for UK students while the entry requirements for UK students is therefore going up. Mm. And if this continues, then it's just going to get harder and harder and harder for them. And it just seems an extraordinary situation that Britain's own higher education system is becoming a place where rich foreigners can get educated rather than British kids. Mm. That is the problem here. And by, in effect, you know, kind of offering two-tier system where, you know, wealthy people from abroad can, can in, in effect, pay more to get in on much lower grades, you are creating a two-tier system, which is has got to be wrong, and it's quite simply unfair, isn't it? Is it clear to you what, what needs to be done? Well, there are two ways of looking at it. One is everyone needs to get together and actually kind of fund the universities better. The other is, if you're going to have a two-tier system, which is partly privatised, then be honest about it. And as you said, this isn't weird, small, niche, not respected institutions. You've been looking at some of the Russell Group universities, the top research universities in the country. As a group, have they responded to this? They have, but I mean, I, we, should, we, should, we should name them. There are 15 Russell Group universities that are offering special pathway courses to allow overseas students to gain access to their degrees with far lower A-level or GCSE grades than the official requirements. They are Durham, Bristol, Exeter, Warwick, Nottingham, Leeds, Manchester, Newcastle, Liverpool, Cardiff, Sheffield, Birmingham, Southampton, Queen Mary University of London, and Queen's University, Belfast. And the statement from the Russell Group universities as a whole said, international students are an important part of our student body, bringing diverse perspectives that enrich the learning environment. Revenue from international students is reinvested into high quality teaching and learning to benefit all students. They said that many international education systems were not aligned with the UK, meaning students could be accepted with a range of qualifications. And they finally added, given the variety of starting points, foundation programmes have long proved a useful pathway to bridge the gap between different education systems. And they said that several universities provided similar pathways for UK students with underrepresented backgrounds. You've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times. With me, Luke Jones, and my guest, the Sunday Times Insight Team, editor Jonathan Calvert and deputy editor George Arbuthnot. You can read Insight's full investigation, including their undercover conversations with other universities, online at thetimes.co.uk if you have a subscription. The producer today was Edward Drummond, the executive producer was James Shield, and sound design was by Marla Seto. If you can, leave us a glowing review. It helps other people scrolling through the same podcast app find us. You can email us as well, storiesofourtimes at thetimes.co.uk. Goodbye.